Welcome everybody to today's seminar. Um, we uh, we have a little competition today. It turns out there's a, a an event uh, uh, sponsored by the AIS and the Japanese consulate. Uh, so there actually will be some people coming in from that event to this very soon, including our associate director, uh, very soon. But um, we're very pleased uh, to have uh, Cherry and George, Dr. George, here today. But before I introduce you, as con as usual here, I'd like to advertise uh, coming events. And our next event is actually a film, a documentary screening of Imak Dari Jambi, Mother from Jambi, which will be, uh, we will be screening on the 17th of November, that's a Tuesday, from 2.30 to 4, in room B5208 in AC1. Um, this is a film, a uh, Ford Foundation film, a documentary about the personal experience of being a waria, a male to female transgender person in Indonesia. So all are welcome to that. But today we're very pleased, as mentioned, to have our neighbor with us today, or from a neighboring institution. Um, at City U, we'd like to claim to be one of Hong Kong's leading institutions, but we have to share the glory uh, here in Kalantong with Baptist University, uh, also, also a fine institution, and which Dr. Uh, George has moved to recently. His research has focused on freedom of expression issues, including journalism and the state in Asia. Just arriving in Hong Kong uh, last year, after 10 years as a faculty member at Nanyang Technological University, also a very highly rated university in the States, according to surveys. He received his PhD in communication from Stanford in 2003 and studied at Columbia University School of Journalism as well as Cambridge University. He spent uh, earlier, his, sorry, his second career, his earlier career as a journalist for the Straits Time in Singapore and is the author of um, books such as Contentious Journalism Toward Democratic Discourse in Malaysia and Singapore, that was 2006, and Freedom from the Press, Journalism and State Power in 2012. Um, I might add that uh, Dr. George, besides being a very well-respected academic is also a public figure, both uh, in Singapore and increasingly here in Hong Kong, and we're very pleased that he was uh, able to take time from his busy, busy schedule to join us today, and we look forward to further cooperation in the future, but immediately we look forward to your talk. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for those kind words. It's uh, entirely my pleasure. Oops. <laughs> uh, it's entirely my pleasure to uh, be with you uh, today, especially because um, the research that I'm about to present uh, is highly interdisciplinary, and uh, I've learned a lot from uh, individuals, researchers from outside of my own discipline, which is uh, uh, communication. Um, I mean, as you know, one of the most uh, successful franchises in uh, because modern uh, political drama combines the themes of uh, free speech and uh, religious offense. Uh, these uh, highly charged uh, performances uh, involve threats to public order, uh, sometimes uh, involving actual violence, uh, and as well as calls for censorship. Uh, several have appeared on the international stage, you know, most promin prominently this year, the Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, killings, the innocence of Muslims, uh, YouTube video, which I'll talk about a little uh, later, uh, the Danish cartoons episode, which uh, celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, uh, and going back to the Salman Rushdie's um, a satanic versus controversy from the late 1980s. Um, many more such instances have taken place at the uh, domestic level. Uh, the more sensational ones this year include the assassination of uh, so-called uh, atheist bloggers in Bangladesh uh, and violence against writers in India. Um, even in Western democracies, the violence that follows uh, cases of religious offense uh, has made some liberals question uh, whether we've gotten the balance between free speech and respect for religion right. Uh, and these incidents, in fact, seem to vindicate uh, more conservative regimes, especially those uh, found in Southeast Asia, uh, where all countries have laws uh, prohibiting religious insult. Uh, conservatives argue that religion is too important an aspect of life uh, to leave up to the whims of uh, free speech, 
and in some countries the official religion, uh, like Malaysia, an attack on that faith uh, is treated as anti-national. But even in secular states like uh, Singapore, uh, with no special ties to any one religion, religious insult is treated as a special category, a particularly a dangerous form of speech that requires the uh, strictest regulation on grounds of maintaining public order. Uh, my research uh, challenges this conventional wisdom um, in the regulation of religious affairs. Uh, the book that I'm in the uh, process of finishing, uh, the title of which is uh, Hate Spin, The Manufacture of Religious Offense and Its Threat to Democracy, um, looks specifically at case studies of the Christian right in the US, the Hindu right in India, and the Muslim right in Indonesia. Uh, so I'll draw on some of my uh, Indonesian research as well as uh, from the Singapore case study which actually doesn't feature in this book simply because it's by global terms, Singapore doesn't really merit uh, uh, as, as deep an analysis. But uh, the Singapore case, of course, does inform the way that I look at this problem. And it's one of the early stimuli, I guess, that got me interested in this uh, whole subject. Uh, and so I'll be presenting today uh, uh, some thoughts about Singapore as well as Indonesia. Um, so I argue essentially that uh, using the law to regulate religious insult is a very bad idea. Uh, I should immediately clarify that um, this is not because I am some sort of a free speech fundamentalist who believes in the absolute right to freedom of expression, uh, nor is it because I'm the kind of uh, secularist uh, who believes that religious sentiments have no place in a modern society. Uh, respect for religion and belief, I think, should be promoted by plural democracies, uh, and some kinds of verbal or symbolic attacks on religious communities do need to be prohibited by law. Uh, however, we must be very careful about where we draw the line separating permissible offence from illegal speech. Uh, it may seem as if uh, applying a lower threshold is simply being more prudent uh, in societies that perhaps for historical reasons are not inclined to take risks with the visceral pulls of uh, religion. Uh, but um, I, would, uh, I would depart from that and argue that uh, uh, prudence, in fact, requires us to be extremely careful about where we draw the line. Um, if we think about um, uh, various harms ranging from the most extreme uh, where speech can be incitement to violence or even genocide, uh, or in less extreme terms, it could incite hostility and discrimination uh, to a much less severe uh, harm uh, of causing wounded feelings. Uh, then the, the question uh, for policy, I guess, is where do we draw the line between what's permitted and what is maybe uh, regretted but not necessarily disallowed. Um, the idea of permitting all of the above, right, of, of even permitting incitement to violence and genocide, which would, I guess, uh, be in line with an absolutist position, in truth does not exist anywhere. There is no constitution, there is no human rights group, there is no free speech group that uh, is in favor of the absolute right to freedom of expression that would include even incitement to genocide. Uh, the debate is instead uh, over where in these uh, in the lower reaches should the line be drawn. The uh, U.S. First Amendment doctrine is quite clear that the line should be drawn um, at a fairly uh, advanced level, uh, at a very uh, fairly high threshold. Uh, U.S. law would essentially only permit uh, state intervention or uh, prohibition of speech uh, if the speech uh, can be shown to directly incite immediate violence. Um, the uh, international human rights standard uh, actually puts the threshold lower. It would consider uh, prohibition to be allowable uh, if the incitement uh, is to hostility or discrimination and not just violence, as the US would put it. But either of those positions, whether it's the US position or the international human rights position, could be described as, the, uh, as a liberal take on uh, incitement. Uh, 
or and free speech, where uh, states are essentially only um, allowed to impose prohibitions or restrictions if actual harm is incited from speech. Uh, it would not be considered a legitimate use of state power uh, to prohibit speech that merely protects uh, wounded feelings. Yeah. Uh, but there are, there's no shortage of states that draw the line exactly there, uh, including Singapore, including Indonesia, uh, and many, many Asian countries uh, would see uh, the state having a legitimate interest uh, in prohibiting speech that wounds religious or racial feelings. <clears throat> and my argument is that this is fundamentally uh, misguided. And to understand why, uh, I think we've got to look more closely at the relationship between uh, offense and harm. The, um, a, a good place to start is um, an extreme case like the uh, Rwandan genocide. Uh, this was a case about which um, there was very little disagreement that uh, the media that actively incited genocide uh, deserved the full force of the law. Yeah. Uh, so the people behind uh, the radio station that was actively promoting hatred, actively promoting the killing of Tutsis, uh, were uh, in the, uh, the what's been called the Rwandan media trial, were put away for a long time. Uh, because their speech uh, actively organized and mobilized people to kill Tutsis. Uh, this is a case of um, essentially offensive speech uh, resulting very directly uh, and demonstrably in violence. Uh, this is what we would classically call hate speech, uh, the, uh, where untruths are propagated with the specific purpose of inciting violence or other harm such as discrimination against the target group. <coughs> so uh, in terms of uh, policy, in terms of, um, of principle, there's very little disagreement uh, within the human rights community that uh, this kind of hate speech uh, deserves serious attention, including the force of law. Yeah. Uh, but what about a case like this? The Innocence of Muslims uh, video uh, whose uh, trailer was um, uploaded to YouTube in 2012, uh, resulting in various governments in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, uh, Singapore's, Indonesia's, uh, asking Google to uh, remove it from view within their territories, which Google obliged according to its own uh, uh, internal um, guidelines, yeah, where it does try to uh, conform with uh, national law uh, in, so in countries where it has a presence. Uh, here you have the case of uh, the video um, producing violence, yeah? uh, but a moment's thought would make us realize that the violence uh, was not, in fact, incited by the video against the target of the offense, but it was the, the reverse. Uh, the, the violence was uh, a reaction to the video. This was a case uh, of what I call offense taking rather than offense giving. And so the ingredients uh, of hate speech are there, offense followed by harm, but the direction of harm is reversed. Uh, the direction of harm is from the vilified community uh, towards the perceived source of the offense. <coughs> Uh, and it is an important and one would think simple distinction, but it is surprising how much in uh, lay discourse and even expert discourse, uh, hate speech is confused with offense taking. Right? Uh, I've read, uh, for example, serious articles calling the Charlie Hebdo cartoons as incitement because the cartoons were followed by violence. Uh, but it was not incitement. The violence was in reaction to the cartoon, not encouraged by the cartoon. Uh, and I think uh, in order to come up with right policy answers, you need to see the distinction between uh, offense giving, classic gay speech, and offense uh, taking. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually lack a vocabulary for this. Uh, so I've um, essentially invented my own term. I call it a hate spin. Uh, and I call it hate spin because it can involve either offense giving uh, or taking uh, as a strategy of uh, contentious politics. 
um, those of you from uh, political sociology will recognize the term contentious politics as coming from um, uh, that field and the look at, uh, um, at everything from um, social movements to riots and protests and so on. Uh, and I found that that uh, body of literature is in fact the most hospitable for the research that I'm doing. Uh, the, um, the field of contentious politics gives us the concept, for example, of injustice symbols. Uh, symbols around which uh, political actors can, um, can mobilize and organize uh, followers uh, towards political ends. Uh, and you can think of something like the, this video or Salman Rushdie's book uh, or Prophet Muhammad cartoons as injustice symbols yeah, that have been used by political actors quite deliberately to, to court support. <coughs> Um, I'll make a few points about uh, uh, hate spin. One is that it challenges the all too common uh, framing of these events um, as spontaneous outpourings of uh, religious emotion. Uh, this is a kind of language that seeps into journalistic accounts uh, and even expert accounts of these, uh, uh, of these events. Uh, how often have you heard um, the phrase used that you know a book sparks violence, uh, a video triggers protests. That kind of language implies that all it takes for a community to, to explode in righteous indignation uh, is the introduction of some offensive speech. Uh, the problem with this sort of framing, I argue, uh, is that it blinds us to the impact of middlemen. Uh, these are political actors uh, who very deliberately and um, uh, very clearly are in the business of uh, deciding uh, which injustice symbols to, to highlight to their communities uh, when protests should start and even when they should end. And I would argue that uh, in, um, in any case of prolonged protest, uh, you will always find these middlemen. You will always find uh, the hand of politics behind what seems like a, a spontaneous eruption of righteous anger. Um, I also argue that uh, hate spin is more symbolic than uh, instrumental in intent. But what I mean by this is that although the offended group may act as if it is uh, reacting to an absolutely intolerable uh, provocation, uh, it is rarely the case that they are, in fact, interested in its complete removal. Uh, the performance of righteous indignation is actually what matters, not the removal of the offence. Uh, this may seem like a, uh, you know, a, a far out statement, but in fact, if you look at any of these incidents, uh, you'll find that the uh, protests tend to end even though the object of the um, offence is still present. Uh, to give you a simple example from Indonesia, uh, as I said, Indonesia was one of the uh, countries like Singapore uh, that banned the uh, Innocence of Muslims trailer. Yeah. Um, this year I went to Indonesia and happened to check at a hotel whether the video was uh, viewable on YouTube. In fact, not only was the trailer viewable, the entire movie, you know, more than one hour, was viewable. Yeah. Uh, so, so why is it that there wasn't uh, continuing outrage uh, and uh, uh, protest regarding the availability of the entire movie, not just the video, uh, on the Indonesian internet? Uh, are we to believe that Indonesians are not tech savvy? Right? They, they don't actually know how to use the internet. And that's ludicrous. I and mean, the Indonesians are. Uh, among uh, the most uh, social media active populations in the world. Yeah. Uh, the same is true in India, where the, the very first country uh, that um, banned uh, satanic verses. Uh, I've checked with activist friends in India as well as Pakistan, and you can order satanic verses by Amazon anytime you want. Yeah. Uh, again, is this because the Indians and Pakistanis don't know of the existence of Amazon? or don't know that there are these uh, ways, uh, you know, are not familiar with the internet. Again, it's a ludicrous proposition. Uh, these to me are uh, just uh, a couple of examples, and examples abound, 
uh, of where, in fact, the protest does not uh, ends despite the continued presence of the provocation. Uh, which is a simple illustration of what I mean when I say that uh, the uh, intent is more symbolic than instrumental. Uh, I would uh, say the same even about what appear to be genocides okay? um, when uh, communities are attacked, when people are killed. Uh, is it really the case that uh, this uh, minority group needs to be removed from the face of the earth before the uh, attackers are satisfied? It turns out it is never the case. Uh, that, that doesn't seem to be what's going on. <coughs> um, related to this is the idea that um, offense in hate spin is asymmetric. What do I mean by this? Uh, simply that offense can be taken uh, even when none is intended. Uh, this is different from classic hate speech, uh, where uh, there is technically, by definition, no such thing as unintended hate speech. Uh, hate speech is the, inten is the intentional vilification of a group uh, to incite harms against it. Uh, the taking of offense, though, uh, turns out uh, uh, to be a strategy that can be used even when no offense is intended. Uh, and this is important to um, remember because it is precisely because of this asymmetric and highly subjective nature of offense taking that regulating insult is such a bad idea. Uh, because uh, how do you test whether there is insult or not? Um, how governments do it is essentially based on the reaction that's created, uh, which would work. It would, might be a just solution if, in fact, the reaction was sincere. But what if it is not? Uh, there is, in fact, no um, adequate test that I know of uh, to distinguish between uh, sincere insult and manufactured insult. Uh, and this uh, is really why uh, we have to be extremely cautious about uh, using the law to regulate it. Uh, so it turns out that permitting uh, free speech while promoting respect for people's uh, religions and beliefs is an extremely complex uh, challenge. Uh, but it is not one that I think requires us to grope in the dark, you know, without uh, any clue of uh, what better ways of doing it are, what worse ways of doing it are. Um, because international human rights principles, I think, do provide uh, some uh, guidelines uh, to help us uh, uh, separate um, uh, permissible speech from uh, impermissible speech. Uh, essentially what we are aiming for um, is a balance between uh, equality, uh, which would require the prohibition of uh, incitement to objective harm, such as discrimination and violence, uh, with liberty, which requires freedom of expression, including, uh, very importantly, the, the freedom to offend. The, um, I'm not sure I got this. I seem to have taken a break from that. <coughs> uh, this balancing act uh, is, in fact, found in the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, in Articles 19 and 20. Um, Article 19 of the ICCPR, which would be familiar to anyone uh, in the area of freedom of expression, um, uh, says that everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. Uh, Article 20 uh, requires states to prohibit any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. Okay. Um, and this is often overlooked by those who claim that instruments like the uh, ICCPR are insensitive to the uh, problem of religious violence and so on. Uh, there is, in fact, um, a strong statement here that requires states to, um, uh, to stand up to incitement. Uh, in fact, this is the only article in the entire treaty that requires the state to impose a certain law. Uh, so with this backdrop, let's uh, turn to my own country, Singapore, and look at how uh, 
uh, it attempts to strike this balance between free speech and religious offense. <coughs> Um, so Singapore is one of those more traditional societies that uh, imposes a much lower threshold that regulates uh, insult and offended feelings uh, as well as uh, actual harms. Uh, and the laws that uh, regulate uh, religious offense include the Internal Security Act, uh, the Sedition Act, the Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act, uh, and the Penal Code. But let me just... Uh, talk about one, which is the newest, the Penal Code uh, Section uh, 298, says this. <coughs> uh, whoever with the deliberate intention of wounding the religious or racial feelings of any person it shall be punished with imprisonment for a term that may extend to three years or with fine or with both. Um, so this could be in the form of words, gestures, objects, however, right? <laughs> it's, it's a catch-all law. Uh, but the key thing is that it attempts uh, to outlaw the deliberate wounding of the religious or racial feelings of a person. Uh, similar phrasing can be found in the um, Sedition Act. Uh, it can be found in Malaysian law, in Indian law as well. Um, how has this law been used? Well, uh, you know, usefully for those of us who are interested in this area, we've had a, a one test case uh, this year and some in previous years as well. Uh, this year has actually attracted quite a bit of international uh, attention. You may have read about it. Uh, this is a 16-year-old blogger by the name of uh, Amos E, uh, extremely precocious uh, young man, shouldn't say young man, child, right? uh, who um, regularly puts up uh, you know, his views in the form of a video blog. Um, not very well known, but he became a national figure shortly after the death of our founding Prime Minister, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Right? Um, so in the official week of mourning, um, Amos Lee puts up uh, a video to give his views on, um, on Lee Kuan Yew. Let me just play a short bit from it, just to give you a flavor of it. Um, Lee Kuan Yew, contrary to popular belief, was a horrible person and an awful leader to our country. He was a dictator, but managed to fool most of the world to think he was democratic and he did so by still granting us the opportunity to vote to make it seem like we have freedom of choice. Um, there are parts that are far more colorful. Uh, this is one of the, the rare paragraphs where he's not uttering the profanity. Uh, so most of it is uh, pretty vulgar. Um, uh, it deserves an RA rating, I guess, even though the you know, performer himself would not qualify an RA rating. Um, the, uh, but it turns out there is actually no law in Singapore that prohibits uh, insult to politicians. Right? Uh, and, the, and defamation law in Singapore, like defamation law in most countries, uh, does not protect the reputations of the dead. Yeah? Uh, so here's an individual with an extremely critical political blog that cannot actually be caught under defamation law. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> So you might have gotten away with it, uh, except that in the middle of his uh, blog, he chooses to compare uh, Lee Kuan Yew to Jesus Christ. So let me show you that bit. Now, seeing what Lee Kuan Yew has done, I'm sure many individuals who have done similar things comes to mind. But I'm going to compare him to someone that people haven't really mentioned before. Jesus. And the aptness of that analogy is heightened, seeing how Christian seems to be a really big fan of him. They are both power-hungry and malicious, but deceive others into thinking that they are compassionate and kind. Their impact and legacy will ultimately not last as more and more people find out that they're full of bull. And Lee Kuan Yew's followers are completely delusional and ignorant, and have absolutely no sound logic or knowledge about him that is grounded in reality reality, which Lee Kuan Yew very easily manipulates, similar to the Christian knowledge of the Bible and the work of a multitude of priests. 
So uh, in legal terms, that was his mistake, right? And in creative terms, in political terms, uh, you know, it's comment. Uh, but uh, in legal terms, that was where he overstepped uh, the mark quite clearly. Um, so several complaints were made to uh, the police by Singaporeans who claimed that Amos Yee's statements were offensive to Christians uh, and therefore ha harmful to social harmony. Uh, and in May, uh, Amos Yee was duly convicted uh, of violating Section 298 of the Penal Code. Um, he was, in fact, also convicted on an obscenity charge um, because the day before this video was released, uh, he also posted a photoshopped uh, image of uh, Lee Kuan Yew having sex with Margaret Thatcher. Uh, this was in response to reports saying that Thatcher had paid tribute uh, to Lee as someone who always got things right. Um, so I don't know, it's hard, impossible to tell whether he would have been prosecuted for that anyway, you know, even if the video hadn't gone up. But uh, clearly what got um, uh, members of the public riled was his uh, profanity-laced uh, uh, video about Lee Kuan Yew. And what um, uh, legally did it in was his mention of Jesus Christ and Christianity in not a very flattering uh, manner. Um, and of course, citing the wounded uh, religious feelings um, as a justification for suppressing what is essentially political speech uh, is a widespread phenomenon. We think of um, uh, Pussy Riot in, the, in Russia, for example. Um, but it's important to recognize that in uh, Singapore, uh, this is a weapon. Uh, by this, I'm referring to the, uh, the law against uh, uh, religious insult. This is a weapon that is not usually wielded by um, uh, pro-government elements uh, or for political reasons. Uh, and in this sense, the Amos Yee case is actually not typical. Uh, the previous cases of alleged religious offense uh, have been pushed by actors on the margins uh, to embarrass powerful interests. Uh, so for example, several cases have involved uh, evangelical Christians' uh, insensitive, insensitive remarks about uh, other religions. Uh, and this seems to be linked to the deep unease that uh, some Singaporeans feel towards uh, aggressive proselytization uh, of evangelical uh, churches. Um, there's also an ongoing uh, cultural battle between uh, conservative Christians and, and gay rights groups, um, and, and clips and cuttings showing evangelicals um, uh, who are unambiguously insulting other faiths um, can be used as smoking guns in this culture war. Right? Uh, so, so some of the political um, battles that result in this sort of uh, uh, police reports are not necessarily uh, arguments with the government. Um, then there was this uh, case <coughs> involving um, a police report made against a Facebook post that, that showed a photo of Muslim children, and you can identify them as Muslims uh, by the uh, boys' headgear. Uh, and their traditional clothes uh, on a school bus belonging to a Muslim kindergarten. Um, the problem was that this uh, poster uh, captioned the photo, bus filled with young terrorist trainees. Yeah. Uh, so this may have passed unnoticed, but for the fact that the person who posted this, uh, uh, this insult against Muslims uh, was a member of the ruling party's uh, youth wing. Uh, so his uh, gaffe was a golden opportunity to embarrass the, the ruling party. Uh, so when this was made public, he um, removed the post, uh, resigned from the party, apologized, uh, and that did not stop a Muslim opposition party member from lodging a police report. Um, so this is one of those cases where we see that you know, for online critics, any evidence of the ruling party living up to its own high standards of sensitivity towards uh, race and religion uh, represents a good form. Um, so a zero tolerance for a religious insult can actually be used against it. Um, unlike other categories of speech regulation in Singapore, where action is usually um, initiated from the top, uh, practically all religious and racial offense cases have been ground up, uh, resulting from uh, complaints uh, lodged by um, members of the public with the police. 
Another curious uh, fact is that in most of these cases, the complainants played a key role in, sp in spreading the offending words and images uh, to a wider audience. Uh, in most of these cases, uh, the, the words or images were initially on smaller online forums, on say, uh, on church websites, not really on uh, public platforms, uh, on personal blogs, Facebook profiles, and so on. Uh, but then they when discovered, they were copied and recirculated on more public platforms, the public Facebook, the more prominent political blogs and uh, forums. So my question is this, I mean, if indeed uh, these were cases of the complainants uh, having internalized the official ideology that race and religion are highly combustible, uh, why did they then uh, spread the flames? Right? Why did they not just make the police report confidentially, and why did they not do their best to keep the offending uh, expression under wraps? Uh, instead, they did the equivalent of calling the fire, uh, the, the, you know, calling the fire department, uh, and while the fire department is on its way, fanning the flame. <laughs> That's effectively what they were doing. Right? Uh, how does this make sense? Uh, it makes sense uh, once we recognize again the, the symbolic rather than the instrumental uh, motivation in the offense taking. Right? It is not so much the removal of the offending words or images that uh, they were after, but the performance of indignation. Uh, in this case, uh, a performance that was backed by state power against uh, specific political targets. Let me move on to Indonesia, because all said and done, you know, the, the, uh, the cases in Singapore are, by international standards, fairly trivial. Right? No bloodshed for, for one. Right? Uh, in Indonesia, a very, very different context. Uh, Singapore is the, uh, the world's most religiously diverse country. Uh, Indonesia, as you know, is the world's largest Muslim-majority country. Uh, it is a, it's home to almost as many Muslims as the five largest Arab states combined. Uh, Muslims account for some 87% uh, of the population. Um, however, since there are some parts of the country with a significant proportion of uh, non-Muslims, the national ideology of Panchasila uh, was framed in uh, religious but inclusive terms. Uh, under Panchasila, Catholics, Protestants, Hindus, and Buddhists uh, were given official recognition. Confucianism was added later. Um, its first principle is belief in one God, uh, making Indonesia officially monotheistic, but not Islam. <coughs> Um, on the bright side, uh, Indonesian Islam <coughs> as well has always been um, known for its uh, internal diversity uh, of viewpoints and the dominant strain has always been uh, strongly uh, pro-democratic and inclusive. Uh, so for example, the two largest uh, Muslim mass movements, uh, Natatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah, uh, firmly support democracy and oppose violence. <coughs> Um, the most strongly Islamist parties have never done well at the, uh, at the polls, uh, which suggests broad support for the separation of religious from political authority, uh, despite uh, a rise of private religiosity uh, and an increase in the appetite for public shows of piety. <coughs> uh, we can think of Indonesia indeed as a, as a consolidated democracy. It's gone through four turnovers of government uh, through peaceful elections. Um, and uh, the, the terrorism threat as well seems to have been contained. <coughs> uh, Sidney Jones, one of the leading authorities on conflict in Indonesia, uh, suggests that the biggest threat to democracy in Indonesia is in fact not terrorism now, but intolerance, uh, which is moving from the radical fringe into the mainstream, to quote um, like Singapore and uh, most other Asian countries, Indonesia has laws that were designed for stability, but sometimes produce the opposite, by uh, encouraging and facilitating expressions of intolerance. Uh, the most problematic is the country's blasphemy law, uh, which prohibits any acts or interpretations that deviate from the basic teachings of a religion. Uh, this was adopted by presidential decree in 1965, largely as a weapon against communism. 
uh, it applies explicitly to the religions that are embraced by the people of uh, Indonesia, those that are given official recognition by the Constitution. Uh, in addition to the blasphemy law, which is targeted at deviations from uh, the orthodox teachings of the six recognized religions, there's Article 156A of the Indonesian Criminal Code, which prohibits deliberate and public expression that abuse or stain a religion to in Indonesia. Um, there are also regulations concerning the siting of places of worship. And, and these all add up to a situation in which the state is called on uh, to take sides in religious disputes instead of upholding the rule of law in an impartial manner. Uh, so Indonesia has uh, witnessed several hate spin cases that have uh, been noted with great concern by religious freedom and free speech monitors uh, globally. Uh, one landmark case uh, involved a self-declared atheist in West Sumatra, Alexander An, uh, who as a result of his uh, atheist Facebook group was uh, imprisoned for two and a half years and fined 100 million uh, rupiah, which is around uh, 7,500 US dollars. Uh, a more systematic campaign has been waged against what hardline groups call the uh, Christianization of Indonesia. Uh, one uh, curious case um, of offense taking involved uh, this statue, a 17 meter tall sculpture called The Three Beauties by Balinese artist Neoman Nuarta. Um, as is typical with most cases of offense taking, there was initially no indication that there was anything provocative about the statue. Uh, and only three years later, after it was installed, did Muslim groups adopt it as an injustice symbol. Uh, the statue actually depicts uh, three women in the traditional dress of the Sundanese community. Um, and uh, Nyoma Nuarta, the artist, has no um, body of work that is explicitly religious. Uh, he is a cultural artist not really a religious artist. But um, the Islamist groups uh, claimed that the sculpture was another Christian provocation because the women actually represented the Virgin Mary uh, or in some uh, eyes, it, this represented the Holy Trinity. Uh, and they were just unshakable in this conviction that this was this statue by a Balinese artist was actually a religious provocation by the Christians. Um, and it had to be taken down. Uh, the essentially, uh, good sense was, could not prevail, uh, and the statue was dismantled and shipped off to somewhere else in Indonesia. Uh, more sustained and serious uh, is the uh, campaigns against uh, church construction. Uh, despite uh, court backing for Christian communities to proceed with their church building plans, uh, local authorities have been slow to conform uh, and as a result, there are a number of uh, Christian communities in Indonesia that have had to uh, worship uh, either outdoors or in uh, makeshift premises uh, while waiting for their building plans to be approved. Uh, the brunt of Indonesian uh, hardline Muslim intolerance, though, is borne not by uh, Christians, but by minority sects, in particular the uh, Ahmadiyya group. Uh, the Ahmadis uh, claim to have up to 40,000 members. Uh, the Ministry of Religion puts the number between about 50,000 and 80,000. Uh, they are denounced as heretical, um, and uh, they've been subject to uh, harassment and outright attack as well. Uh, the worst incident took place in uh, February 2011, uh, when three Ahmadis in uh, Banten's uh, Chikusik district were attacked and killed by a mob uh, after the circulation of messages uh, mobilizing people to attack the congregation. Um, conveniently, there is video of the entire attack uh, because um, uh, in this case, uh, which is similar, as I've just discovered, to attacks by um, uh, Buddhist mobs against Muslims in Myanmar, the attackers are so proud of their work that you Many of them actually video the attacks themselves with their own uh, mobile phones. Um, so this is the case as well. Uh, let me show you two little clips. The first one shows, uh, not very clearly, the arrival of the bomb. Uh, 
but you'll notice that there was a police officer that tried to beat them out. You know? uh, in fact, earlier there were police shops because this was not um, this was not a surprise. Uh, they knew that there was going to be an attack happening. Yeah? Um, but with very little resistance, uh, the mob was able to come to the house housing these uh, small group of Ahmadiyyas and attack them. Uh, the next clip I'm going to show you, uh, if you um, have trouble with extremely graphic images, just turn away for the next 10 seconds. Uh, it is quite horrific, right? But I think it's still worth, uh, I mean, if you, if you do think you can stomach it, uh, uh, just keep your eyes open, but if you don't, uh, please look away. So the um, so three people are killed. They're half naked bodies, repeatedly battered by uh, uh, men with sticks. Some so violently that sticks break, and this they go on. Um, uh, despite this uh, uh, video evidence, by the way, um, of the twelve individuals who were charged, um, public prosecutors asked for just five to seven months of imprisonment. Uh, the court gave them jail sentences of three to six months, which they did not appeal. Uh, and thanks to time already served, uh, they walked free within 15 days of the sentencing. Okay. Um, this case, I mean, it's not only shocking for the level of impunity, but uh, I think what's more relevant uh, to my argument is that none of this was out of the blue or spontaneous. Um, uh, there was, in fact, uh, months or even years of warning that there was explicit hate speech coming from uh, religious leaders, political leaders, uh, calling for the Ahmadiyya to be uh, attacked, killed, thrown out, and so on. Um, there was a warning of this specific attack as well, uh, which could have been averted if there was a political will to do so. Uh, of course, one could say that Indonesia is not Singapore, you know, it's a large country, impossible to police uh, thoroughly. Uh, but this incident was not on some far-flung island, you know, in a different time zone. Uh, this was barely four hours from Jakarta. Yeah, so this is in Java, uh, connected by toll roads and highways from the nation's capital. Uh, and uh, you know, the fact that the attack happened at all uh, can only be put down to um, a, a failure of our government. Um, I think what is worrying about the uh, Indonesian uh, case uh, is that we've reached a stage where you could say that um, intolerance is being institutionalized at various levels. But I should add, of course, that this is not, uh, you know, without wanting to sound too extreme, there is resistance to this as well. There are uh, forces that are trying to keep Indonesia uh, secular, democratic, moderate, uh, and peaceful. Um, but uh, on the other side, you have a legal structure that uh, it dignifies the right to be offended, um, that draws the government out to make statements such as that you know, the Ahmadiyya are not true Muslims and so on, um, which are then cited by violent groups to justify discrimination and violence. Uh, you also have this institutionalized, not just in law, but in uh, organizations and offices. Uh, for example, the Minister for Religious Affairs, uh, when that office is in the wrong hands, uh, can be a force for intolerance, as was the case during um, the, uh, the last presidency. Uh, you have a curious uh, agency called Bako Pakem, whose sole uh, purpose is of this government agency is to look for deviants. Uh, so how is it going to remain relevant other than to continue to find deviants? Yeah? Um, it reminds me of the old saying that you, know, you give a child a hammer, he will look for nails. Uh, so what you see here are various organizations set up as hammers, uh, and no surprise, they continue to find nails uh, in the form of uh, deviant conduct by minority groups. Um, the Indonesian Ulema Council, extremely influential, does not explicitly call for violence ever, 
but it's proclamations about what is uh, uh, non non Muslim or, or an affront or an offense to Islam are then taken up by militant groups like the uh, Islamic Defenders Front FBI, uh, which is motivated by all accounts not by any sort of religious fervor, but again uh, you know, they've been described more as a protection racket. Uh, they're in it uh, for the money. <coughs> So, looking at the uh, Malaysia and Singapore cases together, I mean, um, what can we conclude? Uh, I think that there is no consensus among either social theorists or uh, policy makers about how democracies should deal with potentially divisive uh, cultural differences. The uh, international human rights standards are clear that uh, the right to freedom of religion or belief uh, does not include the right to have a religion of belief that's free from criticism. Uh, nevertheless, uh, creating a right to be offended has, uh, I think, intuitive appeal uh, in many societies, and certainly in Southeast Asia. I think the thought, the, the feeling among many conservatives is that it is better to nip this problem of intolerance in the bud and not wait till it manifests in violence. But I think what uh, my case studies try to argue is that no matter how well-intentioned, uh, trying to use the law to enforce such um, uh, insulation of the public from offensive uh, expression uh, is ultimately naive. It assumes that everyone who claims to be a victim of religious insult is acting in good faith, uh, in the sense of having made a sincere attempt to protect yourself from offense uh, in the spirit of live and let live. Uh, this system, I think, breaks down when people go out of their way to find and fabricate indignation, which is exactly what happens uh, in hate spin. Um, the uh, Singapore case shows that even a secular state that is determined to uh, play fair in its dealings with different religions uh, and is focused on preserving order can find its uh, coercive powers hijacked by hate spin agents. Uh, its approach has been criticized as being too restrictive of free speech. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism uh, recently recommended that the government remove uh, provisions uh, preventing Singaporeans from openly discussing uh, these sensitive matters related to ethnicity because it is important to share views about um, uh, including sensitive matters like religion and race. I think the, the problem with uh, religious insult laws is that uh, I think they undermine um, uh, society's efforts to develop a culture of accommodation that is required in uh, a plural democracy. Uh, because that culture can only evolve with enough horizontal communication. Uh, the more we look to the government as a top-down policeman, the less need there is to work out uh, differences among us. Um, Worse, though, I think it can create this culture of righteous indignation, which can even become competitive. Uh, in the case of Singapore, and we see it I think, even more starkly in India, uh, uh, religious communities uh, compete over the right to be offended. Um, the kind of uh, uh, Hindutva, extreme right-wing Hindu intolerance that we see now, uh, is uh, quite clearly learned from India's religious minorities. Uh, the the uh, Hindu groups in India, I think, reached a point when they felt that they shouldn't allow Muslims to monopolize the right to be offended and learned the art of being offended from uh, minorities like the Muslims and the Christians and now with, uh, with very ugly consequences. Uh, I think we should also point out that um, most of the insult laws are used protect human institutions, not God, uh, and usually as well to pr protect male dominance. Um, one small case that illustrates this from Singapore uh, is the censorship of a play in the year 2000 called Talak. Uh, this was a play about uh, marital violence and rape uh, within the uh, Indian Muslim community, uh, which drew a lot of uh, flack from a small group of uh, Indian Muslims and in the interest of preserving racial and religious harmony, the play was banned. But whose interests really were being preserved by, uh, by this ban? Uh, you know, obviously, it was uh, the, the feelings of uh, the, the 
dominant males within that community rather than any sort of religious uh, interest. Um, <clears throat> in societies like Indonesia, and, and I think this is the most worrisome, uh, insult laws, uh, when they are applied in a society that uh, uh, does not respect all religions equally, or where there is a dominant religion, uh, those laws tend to result in further persecution of minorities. Yeah. Uh, and this, again, I think is a clear pattern uh, worldwide. So if we relook this um, this framework uh, of where the line should be drawn between the illegal and the permitted, uh, what we actually see is this, that it depends on whether the target is a minority group or a majority group. Uh, and what we see in Indonesia, as well as in a distressing number of other countries, uh, is that anything goes if the target is a religious minority. Uh, you can insult their feelings, uh, you can indulge in hate speech, incite violence and even genocide against them. But if the target is a majority community, uh, even their feelings are off the list. Uh, we see this um, in Indonesia, we see this now in Myanmar uh, and beyond Asia as well. Um, so in conclusion, in conclusion, I would just say that I think the, um, the debate over um, freedom of speech and its uh, tension with respect for religion uh, is in fact not as important as some other things uh, going on that the priority really in many of these societies is to uh, push for uh, equal legal protection for people's freedom of religion and belief uh, and against discrimination uh, and, and violence. Um, attempts to shield communities from religious insult uh, are relatively trivial and at worst backfire in this, in this larger struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, insightful and uh, systematic talk. I, besides the very interesting Southeast Asian case studies, I think you provided us with a fascinating framework for thinking about these issues. If I could just start, um, I was thinking a bit about the German example. And um, there you may have an example, if I sort of can adopt some of your own terminology, of um, uh, liberal offense taking. So the, the, the government is, I mean, it, of course the background is the, the whole issue of, of, of the post-war German democracy and the defense against the extremes of the Nazis on the one hand and the communists on the other. Both were banned in the 1950s, but there's been this continuing discussion particularly focused on the right uh, right-wing parties of, of whether they can be allowed, but most recently in the uh, immigration discussion with the increase in immigration to Germany and some obvious cases of apparent incitement at rallies, anti-immigration rallies, and also, of course, the attempt to assassinate a politician running for mayor in Cologne who had pro-immigration stances. Um, the, you know, the, the, the German government is considering drawing certain lines along the, along the side of this, this tradition. I mean, does, does, does this fit into your framework in the sense that you said, I mean, from a liberal perspective, it's, it's okay because they're protecting a minority of the immigrants, and, and, and it's, a, it's in a sense the liberal view would be to, to use offense taking to, to protect the weaker. I mean, in, in, in a sense, and that sort of illustrates the problem in the Indonesian case is the, the offense taking is used to protect the strong and, and weaken further the weak. Am I on the right track in terms of my thinking about that comparison? Yeah, I think that there has been, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> um, there has been an important shift in, um, in thinking about offense. Uh, that is precisely along the lines that you mentioned, that the, it, is sign it is very important to consider whether the target is the part of the dominant majority uh, or minority group. Um, in the past, I think uh, not just um, Asian societies, uh, any traditional society, uh, as recently as 50 years ago, I think that the conventional wisdom was that, um, well, of course the law should protect uh, the dominant culture 
uh, you know, the, the groups that, um, that represent society at large and so on. Uh, and so you had, even in Western um, jurisdictions, you had uh, court rulings that would uphold censorship of um, material that offended the, the dominant religious group. Uh, and, and it was taken as almost commonsensical that that is the purpose of law, right? To, to uphold the uh, dominant values. But I think uh, human rights thinking has, uh, has turned that over 180 degrees. Uh, so the uh, current thinking is that um, the uh, dominant majority does not need the law to uphold its anything. Yeah? Uh, uh, the, the very fact that it's dominant means that it can look after itself. Uh, it can uh, use uh, social influence, it can use political power, it can use uh, its civic resources, it can use the media uh, to uphold its values. But there is no need for the law to step in, and um, uh, especially in ways that might inhibit the freedom of speech. Uh, instead, the, uh, if, if the law is to step in, uh, it should really be to protect the weak. Yeah? Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, I guess the, the argument from political theory would be that uh, these are uh, historically disadvantaged groups that would not be able to fight uh, uh, um, effectively uh, on, in the marketplace of ideas because the marketplace of ideas is uh, tilted um, against them. Not because they, they lack the quality of their ideas but simply because for historical reasons. Uh, and to redress that imbalance, uh, there is a function for the, uh, the, the law to protect, um, certain kinds, uh, protect them from certain kinds of speech. But even there, I think the, uh, I mean, uh, as I tried to emphasize, the uh, human rights thinking would uh, not be in favor of uh, protecting the feelings of migrants or religious minorities and so on. Uh, there needs to be a demonstration that the speech would result in actual harms. Um, discrimination or words. Thank you. Uh, just three quick questions. The first one is, this kind of discussion that you are doing, your analysis, is this safe in Singapore to do? A, don't answer yet. So I mean, <laughs> you, you can do these things and then say all these variations of what interpretations and you, you will be safe. Okay. But my second question is, uh, the, re the re redefining what is offense, like the case of Malaysia, the use of Allah by the Christians, the Muslims felt offended by it, and you know, after many appeals and, and the court challenges, in the end, uh, the Christians were told that they cannot use the word Allah. And so, it's a, for me, it's a case of redefining what is offensive, what which for many, for decades, uh, was not offensive. All of a sudden, it became offensive. And the third question I have is, uh, it's not Southeast Asia, but in the case of China, again, redefining the, the dynamics of religion. Like, like you have the Dalai Lama, you have the Tibetans who regard him as representation of their, of their divinity. And then China creates their own Dalai Lama. So meaning they make their own definition of, of what, is, what is divinity. And then if you don't do that, I mean, they have their own ways to punish people. So how does that fit into your analysis? Uh, the first question, uh, oh yes, and I don't see why this is not, uh, I mean, my argument is not presentable in Singapore. Uh, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, the second question, uh, which had to do with Malaysia, uh, yes, I mean, it is, um, you described it as, uh, uh, what is the term used again? Redefinition. The redefinition, that's right. The, the redefinition of offense um, is, is certainly what I'm looking at. Yeah? That um, the nature of offense taking as a, prof as a political strategy is extremely flexible and extremely creative, uh, which is precisely why uh, uh, states should never make the mistake of trying to satisfy uh, those who claim to be offended because they will just find something else uh, to be offended by until they no longer uh, have any purpose to, you know, to go down that route. Um, the, uh, and the example that you give, uh, which is the, uh, whether, whether non-Muslims are allowed to use the, uh, the term Allah, um, uh, 
despite the fact that um, there are several Muslim states that permit it, um, you know, that evidence was seen as not persuasive in Malaysia yeah? uh, for some reason. Um, uh, and, and yes, that is it's, it's a classic case of, of hate spin to me. You know? This was not really about protecting uh, the tenets of the belief. Uh, it wasn't even um, intended as an insult to Islam, uh, which is uh, makes it again um, a good example of the asymmetry of offence taking. Offence can be taken even when no offence was intended. Uh, you never know uh, in what form offence will be taken. Um, and uh, it's foolhardy to me to, uh, for the state to try and uh, scratch that itch because people will find somewhere else that itches. The, the third point that you raised, uh, I'm, I'm not following that, so I'm not sure I have any comment to add, but uh, you might want to say something about it yourself. About, uh, no, well, related to that, it's what is law. <coughs> Well, for <coughs> Christians, there's uh, an aspect of Christianity saying that laws that are not just need not be followed. Mm -hmm. So, but what happens if the lawmaker, the legislature, mm, or the whoever makes that law it does not really accept what this, this, this <laughs> distinctions of what is just and what is not just? They just do it out of political convenience. So then, how does, because you mentioned laws, uh, it's in the title of your talk. Mm. So, but law itself, it can, can be very tricky. Mm. I have a couple of questions. First, do you see that uh, this hate spin, is a very interesting concept, I think that what kind of, does it need any opportunities to arise? I mean, kind of, or can any situation basically be used to spin into hate if you want to? or is there certain conditions, I mean, if you're looking at that. Um, and then, secondly, maybe, is the rise of the internet giving more, or making it more easy to use uh, yeah, hate, or can spin things into hate? Yeah. And, yeah, I, I think this is the, the second question. So, generally, is there any social changes or any kind of opportunities that, or maybe the rise of the internet and new media that make it easier <coughs> to spin things into hatred, or is that a phenomenon you would see as having always existed in the same way mm -hmm. over time? Mm -hmm. you know, I think um, uh, traditional hate speech, of course, has a very long history. Yeah? Um, I, uh, and so I don't think it's anything new. Uh, I do think that the strategy of offense taking is mm -hmm. something newer. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I suspect that it is on the increase. Uh, I'm not 100% uh, sure why, but uh, let me speculate that one reason why uh, offense taking has become more popular uh, is precisely because it is no longer as politically acceptable uh, to use out and out hate speech. Um, uh, at least in societies where um, political actors are expected to maintain a certain level in their political discourse. Uh, it is n uh, no longer acceptable to, to openly vilify a community. Yeah? Uh, uh, it is no longer acceptable to openly indulge in racist speech in, in political rhetoric. Uh, so you can actually, I think, uh, offense taking allows you to achieve the same thing without calling people names. Uh, because you simply uh, choose to take offense at their practices and uh, their beliefs, uh, 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 claiming that uh, you are the victim of uh, an intolerable uh, insult. Uh, <clears throat> uh, an example of this would be uh, what is happening uh, in the United States right now uh, with this campaign that's been called Islamophobia. Uh, this is a campaign uh, pushed by identifiable political actors uh, that have chosen to take offense at the building of mosques, uh, that have chosen to take offense at uh, Sharia law, for example. Uh, in the American context, it would, be, uh, uh, it would go down badly if 
uh, they uh, came out and indulged in purely racist speech against um, a very small Muslim minority in the US. But they are getting away with the promotion of fear around um, um, the building of mosques and uh, uh, Sharia law. Uh, so, so I do, uh, I suspect that it has become um, a rather effective and um, uh, you know, a form of mobilizing publics. It is an effective form, a way in which um, you can get attention from the elites and governments. Um, uh, it is also made effective by the fact that you know we live in presumably an age of people power, right? So public opinion matters um, uh, in a way that didn't uh, a few generations ago. Um, if that is the case, it makes it very difficult for a government to stare down the offence takers. Uh, because here you have mobs who claim that their deepest feelings have been violated. You know, uh, it is, I think, extremely difficult for, for leaders to tell them that, look, uh, you say you're offended, but really you should just turn around and go home. Right? Uh, politically very difficult. What do you do with uh, this, out, this angry mob? Uh, in, a, in an age of people power, you have to give them something. Uh, so it turns out, I think, to be a rather effective uh, strategy. Your, your question about the internet, uh, I think what the internet provides is um, a bottomless well of uh, injustice symbols. Um, uh, beyond that, I don't think that uh, hate spin actually requires the internet. So if you look at most of the, um, the, the global cases that we have seen, uh, very few of them actually involve the internet. Um, uh, Charlie Hebdo didn't. Um, the Prophet Muhammad cartoons didn't. Uh, it, uh, it, the uh, cartoons were transported from Denmark to the Arab League in a hard copy folder. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the offense was spread by satellite TV rather than internet. Uh, even the Innocence of Muslims uh, video, which of course was a YouTube phenomenon, uh, was spread largely through satellite TV rather than uh, you know, people actually looking at the video online. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, it seems like hate spin agents um, are far too creative um, to, to, to limit themselves to, to any one medium. They can get around any, any uh, media technology uh, given the political will to do so. Um, I thought your, your presentation your analysis is really persuasive. Your examples are great. Your concepts are really interesting. But I'd just like to go back to something you said at the very beginning. And, um, you said um, respect for religion and belief should be promoted, presumably by the state. And you also said some kinds of attacks on religion should be prohibited. So I, I find this a very difficult thing to to um, accommodate into a, um, uh, you know, the ideas about a constitution which is pluralistic and diverse and guarantees freedom of expression and so on. Because in, um, in most societies where there is reasonable amount of free expression, there are, there are uh, quite strong critiques of religion which address the very foundations of religion. The, 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 um, validity of religion and so on. Um, now, it's one thing to um, assure, as it's a matter of statecraft, that people have the freedom to believe. It's another thing to promote respect for religion um, or to prohibit some attacks on religion. So I would just like to hear your ideas about how that would be done. And does promoting respect for religion, does that include any kind of sanctions? Or does it have implications for education and so on? Yeah, um, yeah the, the promotion side uh, is often only given lip service. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most uh, countries uh, would uh, agree that it's a good thing to promote respect for your fellow man, including uh, uh, for those who religious, uh, people with religious beliefs. Um, but what do people actually do about it? I, I personally think a lot more could be done. Uh, even within uh, secular uh, societies that um, uh, officially uh, want to stay, uh, uh, want to keep religious authority completely out of the, um, uh, uh, separate from state authority. Um, so this would include, of course, education. I mean, what kind, uh, how is religion talked about in uh, civics education? 
uh, it would include uh, some you know, basic awareness about the world religions or the religions that are present within the community. Uh, that could be uh, done by the state uh, uh, as long as it is not um, um, uh, does not uh, uh, stray into uh, proselytizing. Yeah? Um, and many states do it, right? And I think you know, even uh, in U.S. schools, where in, U in the U.S. where there is a stricter um, separation of state and church than in most societies, uh, uh, public schools do teach about religion. That is a simple way of, I think, uh, promoting uh, respect. Uh, it's uh, recognizing the role of religion in life and public life. Um, there have been, I think, more creative ways in which you could. Um, um, uh, there the, are the creative ways in which society can take a stand, uh, including the use of uh, political influence, but not the law. And again, that I think is an underused resource. Uh, I think too many um, secular democracies uh, say that uh, since we cannot, since our law cannot take sides with one religion or against another religion, therefore, politically, there's nothing we can do. But I think there is a difference between um, uh, making political statements and uh, using the law. Um, and it is done. I mean, so if you look at what um, uh, any US president does, which is to visit places of worship, uh, to have a prayer breakfast, uh, what is that other than to demonstrate uh, uh, respect for religion? I mean, the, uh, there is, despite the First Amendment uh, prohibition on um, uh, on the establishment of uh, uh, of religion in the U.S., that has not stopped American presidents from having prayer breakfasts. Yeah? Um, so, if the U.S. president can have a prayer breakfast, uh, why can't he visit a mosque? Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the, the current U.S. president has yet to visit a mosque in the U.S. Simply not because he can't, uh, uh, in, uh, not because there's any constitutional prohibition against him doing so, but simply because he lacks the political courage. Yeah? Um, the uh, I mean there, there are, I think many positive examples of where states can take a stand and one actually comes from Germany and I love this example the uh, of how um, uh, in response to the anti-immigrant group what's it called uh, Pegida Pegida yeah um, a number of of German cities uh, uh, that wanted to. Um, respect the right of these protesters to march down the streets with their vow messages, but at the same time show that they distanced themselves from the message, uh, they just turned off all the lights. <laughs> uh, that was brilliant, right? So, so the, the, this group shows up um, in front of Cologne Cathedral, uh, mm -hmm. and the law says that they are free to demonstrate in front of Cologne Cathedral at night. But this is one of Germany's most iconic and most beloved icons. So you can give this group the right to protest, but that doesn't mean that they have the right uh, to use um, the, uh, the photo opportunity of a fully lit Cologne Cathedral behind them, uh, turn off the lights. Yeah? Uh, and uh, they did the same at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. Yeah? Uh, so wherever this group goes, the public authorities um, or the church authorities and so on turn off the lights. Uh, that's the kind of uh, public signaling, I think, that uh, any democracy can do regardless of uh, 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 constitutional provisions against uh, establishment of uh, church. So would that go um, lead the state to discourage or find ways to um, actively um, interfere with, um, for example, atheist um, groups which explicitly attack religion as an adult, um, or to attack religions uh, I shouldn't say attack religions, but to attempt to discredit um, a particular religious narrative through historical uh, excavation of its origins, as, for example, people are doing with the Mormons and other other uh, sectarian groups. Well, yeah, I, I don't have the answer to, to that one, frankly. I think uh, uh, different um, Different democracies have, uh, have different ways to answer that question. In the US, of course, uh, the state would be absolutely prohibited to take sides in any such thing. Yeah? And, and I think there is actually a great deal of merit to that uh, clarity. I think most other countries are tempted 
to give some kind of protection to major religions against sort of out and out uh, assault uh, on their on their core beliefs. Um, um, I used to think that the American solution was rather harsh, where basically anything goes in speech. Uh, I've come round to the position that the, that the clarity that gives uh, may actually be a good idea, because uh, it tells uh, every religious community that uh, whatever problems you have with those who disagree with you, uh, you can absolutely not expect any help from the state. Um, and I think that encourages uh, religious communities to find uh, other avenues to, uh, to protect themselves in the marketplace like this, uh, which I think is a good thing. Yeah? Uh, so if you look at the way the uh, most American of religions, uh, Mormonism, has uh, responded to the full frontal assault of the Broadway production, uh, The Book of Mormon, uh, they've done it in an extremely civilized way, in which I think uh, most other faith groups can learn from. Uh, the Mormons have a very clear policy of um, uh, not making a fuss whenever they are reviled in popular culture, and, and the Mormons are in fact reviled uh, quite a bit in popular culture in the US, but they have a clear policy against not taking the bait. Uh, they use it as an opportunity to educate people about what their faith really stands for. They will take out advertisements, for example, but they're not going to, uh, to fight it. Um, uh, and I think that is a direct outcome of the clarity that the First Amendment provides that uh, uh, no faith group can expect uh, help from this, from this field. Uh, if I just follow up to be fair, though, the Mormons are a religious minority behaving well. And I think we do find religious minorities tending to behave well in these kind of contexts, whereas you know, the religious majority, say the Christians, um, easily come out with these uh, offense about the <coughs> Muslim minority and so on. <coughs> if the, the, you mentioned earlier the case of Myanmar, and, and it strikes me that Myanmar is in Southeast Asia at the moment, the case where you know, what you're talking about is he said, at its worst. And we do have that law that was passed last summer. I wondered if perhaps you would comment on that. That strikes me as being it's very similar to what's going on in Indonesia, if not worse. But also, of course, the issue of Aung San Suu Kyi and her party's reticence. Now, this is sort of a political science question. I mean, it's, it's not a, she's not in power, although she's trying to be. And the, you know, the dilemma is this. On the one hand, she's, she claims to be fighting for democracy, and she's fighting a very unevil, un uneven battle against the military, which has one-fourth of the seats reserved, and therefore feels like she can't afford to offend the majority Buddhist sentiment in the country, which is increasingly intolerant, it seems. Um, uh, on the other hand, of course, according to your kind of discussion here, she's you know, shamefully um, uh, showing a shameful lack of courage. I mean, if Obama won't visit a mosque, the fact that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi wouldn't put a single Muslim candidate on, on her ticket, the BBC has run some interesting documentaries recently about way Muslims in Myanmar feel. That seems, for a democracy icon, a shameful case of, of lack of courage. I wonder if you comment on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, in, in my introduction chapter, I mentioned both uh, Obama and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi um, as uh, rather um, distressing examples yeah, uh, of, well, they're the only two active politicians who are Nobel Peace Prize laureates, yeah? uh, and neither of them have been particularly inspirational uh, in, in dealing with the uh, forces of hate. I mean, Obama, I guess, much better, but uh, even he had to climb down after the controversy over the so-called um, uh, mosque at Ground Zero uh, mm -hmm. in was it, 2010, yeah? uh, where he first said the right thing, and there was a backlash from the religious right and within 24 hours, he moderated his view uh, and, and actually said that, well, just, you know, yes, he had said that it was within the right of any group to build a uh, place of worship wherever they wanted, but that does not mean he's saying that it's wise of the Muslims to build a uh, place of worship right there. You know, a shocking lack of, uh, uh, of political courage, I thought. But I think even that, yes, I think pales in comparison to the... Um, the sense of um, disappointment that many of us feel uh, about what's going on in uh, Myanmar. Um, but, you know, as you say, looked at through the lens of um, uh, political analysis, you know, it's not at all surprising that uh, 
political actors behave this way. Um, so what can one do? I mean, I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, when you look at um, cases like this around the world, uh, there are societies that are so far gone that, you know, it's difficult to know how to unwind at all, right? And, and maybe all we can say is, you know, those societies that have not reached that, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, level of uh, despair should learn from those that have. I mean, where, do, where would one start uh, in terms of trying to unwind what's happening in Myanmar? It's very difficult to tell. I, mean, I, I think Indonesia is probably more hopeful yeah, because there are uh, more institutions, there are more organizations and existing networks, a very rich civil society and media and so on that could be the uh, serve as the soil from which you would build a more tolerant society. And certainly, I mean, what's uh, happened... Um, uh, since the uh, you know, new Indonesian president uh, and the uh, new Jakarta governor and so on, there have been uh, impressive signs of their willingness to stare down uh, uh, religious extremists. Um, so I think the situation varies from uh, country to country. I mean, uh, Malaysia, one would hope, is a country that uh, uh, can be brought back from the brink, yeah, even though things seem extremely dicey. Uh, uh, India uh, does not, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean if, if things improve in India, it would probably be because um, Modi uh, continues to make a mess or uh, continues to be unable to make the economy recover and will be kicked out because of that. Uh, it is difficult to uh, see a situation where um, the BJP will suddenly decide to reform itself. So it, it is a, a depressing topic, and I think when you look at different countries, uh, the, unfortunately there are situations, there are countries where you, uh, you're tempted to just say that, well, you know, maybe things need to get worse before they get better. Mm. Well, on that uh, less than uh, hopeful <laughs> note, uh, I'd nonetheless like to uh, express our, uh, our uh, thanks for a fascinating talk and uh, also for your uh, answers to uh, a long series of questions from us. So thank you again. Thank you.